Welcome, everyone. I'm Sandra Bargeman. A few years ago, I wrote and performed a solo show called The Edge of Every Day, which was an exploration of the rough edges and contradictions we all face and grapple with. The show hit a nerve, and the relevance of the topic would only grow over time more than I could have foreseen. So, here we are. Real talk with real people, sharing stories and perspectives that spark provocative invitations to leap out of what's safe. On the edge of every day. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. We are live in the hive. Thank you for joining me on this, the 25th episode of The Edge of Every Day here on talkradio.nyc. Oh my goodness, 25. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, and for those of you who don't know me yet, I encourage you to check out my bio on talkradio.nyc, or of course, visit my website, sandrabargeman.com. And please tune into any of my previous episodes with my inspiring guests. In a nutshell, this show is about celebrating triumphs, pushing boundaries, and exploring rough edges. Through conversations and shared stories with friends and colleagues, it's my hope that we can begin to understand our edges. And what I mean by edges is those places where we are fearful, those places where we are resistant to change, those places where paradoxes and contradictions live in our beliefs and our understandings, both about ourselves and about the world around us. Listen, we live in turbulent times, and we are coming to understand that life isn't simply black or white. It must be an embrace of both, and the more we recognize our own edges and get real about them, the more we can help others to do the same. And that, I fully believe, can help to change the world. So thanks again for tuning in. And without further ado, it is time to introduce our guests this evening. Christy Cooper is an Emmy award-winning cinematographer with a PhD in neuroscience and an MS in microbiology. Christy communicates complex issues through storytelling and visual narrative to create human connection and impact around the most pressing issues of our time. Christy left a successful academic and research career in Europe to obtain an MFA in science and natural history filmmaking. In 2011, Christy co-created Stories of Trust, calling for climate recovery, a 10-part documentary series featuring youth plaintiffs suing their state governments over climate change with Witness, a social justice human rights organization focused on using film for social change. She most recently directed and produced the feature documentary Youth v. Gov, now streaming on Netflix. Christy is first a proud and committed mother, as well as the inaugural SF Film Vulcan Productions Environmental Film Fellow and the first Jacob Burns Film Center Focus on Nature, Artist in Resident. Chantal Bilodeau is a Montreal-born, New York-based playwright whose work focuses on the intersection of science, policy, art, and climate change. She founded Arts and Climate Initiative over a decade ago, and her in her capacity as artistic director, has been instrumental in getting the theater and educational communities, as well as audiences in the US and abroad, to engage in climate action through programming that includes live events, talks, publications, workshops, national and international convenings, and a worldwide distributed theater festival. In addition to her own plays, she is the co-editor of an anthology of short plays about the climate crisis titled Lighting the Way. Her work has been presented in a dozen countries around the world and has received many prestigious awards. She's currently writing a series of eight plays, The Arctic Cycle, that look at the social and environmental changes taking place in the eight 
Arctic states. In 2019, she was named one of the eight trailblazers who are changing the climate conversation by Audubon magazine. Hello and welcome, Christy and Chantal. Hi, Sandra. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. Oh, you are most welcome. It's a fabulous introduction for two fabulous ladies and welcome to you, Christy, as well. Thank you so much, Sandra. It's an honor to be here. An honor to be here with you as well, Chantel. Okay. Well, I'm truly honored to have you both. This is great to have two complete warrior women for the climate movement. It's not, I normally have one and I'm very jazzed to have you both on. <laughs> so um, I met, I like to always share how I meet people and Chantal and I met in New York City um, at a talk that she gave, and it also included a presentation of one of her um, fantastic plays. And I have since been following Chantal and had her as one of my first guests on my podcast. So it's fantastic to have you back, Chantal. And I met the wonderful Christy Cooper through uh, a mutual friend of ours, Leslie Michaels, who has her own podcast. Um, so shout out to her, Women We Should Know podcast, and Leslie has a book coming out. She's going to be a guest on this podcast on the 6th of June. Fantastic. So you both have spectacular projects going on. Um, one of the things that, that I so loved about this, and it was such a great learning experience for me to really plug into it, is not only does your work of course, educate and inspire and move people, hopefully, out of overwhelm and apathy into action, but also it, there, it's firmly grounded in the understanding that the, the climate issue, the issue of climate change is also a human rights issue. And I think a lot of people who are interested in, in climate change and get and learning more about it really need to grab onto that understanding that it's an overarching umbrella over all of these issues. Wouldn't, would you not agree, Christine? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, climate change is the human rights issue of our lifetime. I mean, it, 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 it basically encompasses you know, most of the issues that we're experiencing around the world and um, that frontline communities are experiencing, whether that's food insecurity, war, war you uh, migration, um, you know, there's, there's so Economy. many. Economy. Yeah. Yeah. You name it. You yeah. name it. Well, so let's dive in with you first, Christy, about your incredible movie, um, Youth v. Gov, your award-winning independent film, Youth v. Gov, the story of Juliana versus the United States of America, constitutional lawsuit, and the 21 American youth ages 14 to 25 who are taking on the world's most powerful government. Since 2015, the legal nonprofit, Our Children's Trust, has been present, representing these youth in their landmark case against the U.S. government for violating their constitutional rights to life, liberty, and personal safety and property through their willful actions in creating the climate crisis they will inherit. So please, you were in on this story very, very early on. Please tell us the history of your involvement in creation of this film. Yeah, so you uh, you kind of mentioned in the introduction the, the series of 10 short films that I worked on back in 2011, 2012, The Stories of Trust. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of my my introduction to this whole, um, well, to, to youth um, suing their governments. Um, at, at the time, those were youth who were su suing their state governments. Um, but those youth were also all represented by our Children's Trust. Um, so, so Julia Olson, who, who when you watch the film, you'll see she's this brilliant attorney um, who represents it's these phenomenal. young people. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Her presence and it just from, with these kids and with the legal system was just mind blowing. Yeah, she's a very brilliant attorney. Um, she founded her organization in 2012, 2010, sorry, um, with the goal to represent young people in, in, in climate litigation using the best available science. And um, 
she on Mother's Day in 2011 filed cases, legal actions in every state across the country, as well as the first um, federal lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So as part of this campaign at that time uh, with these state cases, um, together with Witness, there were these 10 short films that were created. So at the time I met Kelsey Juliana, who was suing the state of Oregon. She's now featured in Youth Gov, and she's the named plaintiff in this case. Um, also, Shutesca Martinez, who is a young Aztec man from Colorado. Um, that was when I met him. He was only 11 years old at the time. Oh. And Jamie Lynn Butler from the Navajo Nation. Um, she was, God, I think she was eight years old, I think, back in 2011 when we when we did the, the short film about her. So, I, you know, that was kind of my first introduction, A, into working with young people and to um, also my first film about my first films about um, the legal system and climate litigation. And so it was a big like throughout those couple of years of, of of creating those shorts and working with those young people. I, I learned a lot through Witness about the ethics of storytelling from a human rights perspective and how we worked with youth and minors. Um, and, and also I dug really deep into the legal aspects of, of, of climate litigation and learned so much. So in 2015, when they filed this new federal lawsuit, I, I was kind of on the in and I knew, you know, I knew the legal team. I knew some of these plaintiffs. I knew some of the families. I was, um, you know, very interested and curious to see where the case was going to go because the first federal case um, was pretty quickly dismissed. And when they made it all the way, you know, they filed in August of 2015, immediately thereafter, the entire fossil fuel industry um, and the Nas National Association of Manufacturing um, filed a motion to intervene in the case, and they wanted to co-defend the case along with the government against these 21 youth. Um, so there was a hearing for that, for this motion to dismiss by the, by the fossil fuel industry um, in March of 2016. And Judge Coffin ruled in the youth's favor and denied the intervener's motion to dismiss. So that was the first moment where I realized, like, I think this case is going somewhere. There's more, there's more to this. Julia had gone back to the drawing board and kind of brought, she, you know, she she realized that this is a constitutional issue. And the first case was not based on the con constitution, it was solely based on the public trust doctrine. So this second case was much more involved. It was, you know, it's it's very heavily focused on on constitutional rights and the public trust doctrine is still, it's an element that's still in this case. Um, so that was the moment that I went to Julia and said, can I follow this? Will you give me, um, you know, ex exclusive access to, to tell this story and permission to, to work with these plaintiffs and, you know, to, will you give me access basically? Um, and so it's been, that's been my journey ever since was, you know, just trying to be wherever I could be when climate events were happening to the, to the young people, whether it was forest fires or droughts or hurricanes or floods, you know, trying to, to be there to tell those parts of their, their harm, which is a big part of their case. Um, but also to be there for the, for the legal moments, for the moments in the case, for these moments where they're building their family and their, their rapport. Um, and yeah, you can see it all in the film. <laughs> Absolutely, you can see it all in the film. Well, something um, we're going to need to go to break, but something that that I, I just uh, I'm completely blown away by is is your being in the right place at the right time in terms of the youth. You've been mentioning that over and over, and working with them, and the joy of working with youth, and that's a dovetail between the two of you, and and as this youth movement explodes mm -hmm. and through social media and finally the buck stopping with this group of people who young people who understand they're we're, we're at the end we can't shove this under the carpet one second longer and we have all of the knowledge and all of the platforms to get this information out in a way that the three of us might not have had when we were young anyway we need to take a break when we come back Chrissy will comment on that, her working with the young people. And then we will move into Chantal's play, No More Harveys, that just had a successful debut in Anchorage, Alaska. Stay tuned on the Edge of Every Day. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy. And I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. 
Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Chipping around, kick my brain to the ground. These are the days that never rain. On the edge of every day, and we are back with Christy Cooper and Chantal Bilodeau. Uh, for those of you who are listening in, we're having a lovely little chat during the commercial break about uh, one of the plaintiffs in Christy's movie is from Anchorage, and Chantal just was in Anchorage for No More Harveys and is going to be there again with another project that she is doing that we will talk about. So... So yeah, that just being, this is the, the thing that, I, that jumped out at me. I just recently watched, I couldn't be there in person to see Chantel's glorious play, but I was able to watch it live streamed. And I talked to her afterwards and I said, the thing that jumps out, at, uh, that dovetails so much the most for me with your two projects is the youth element and the power of that. Mm. Yeah. And so, Christy, you, you, it must have been quite something to, to see all these young people while the, you know, the movement was exploding, while yeah. you're making all these movies. You know, it was really interesting when these youth filed these first cases in 2011, that was the, you know, these were the very first ever youth-led climate litigations. Um, and when I started first filming with these kids, when, when youth, be, when, the youth, the inception of youth be gov, there was not a, a youth movement at the time. There was not, there, there hadn't even, there had been one people's climate march in 2012, but there had not been a, like a youth movement really present there or organized or something like that. And it was in 2016 that there was the very first um, um, youth led climate um, march. I, I believe that was 2016. So, you know, this is, I've seen kind of over the last 12 years really this the birth of of this youth movement and you know that's not to say that youth have not always been active and have been involved in this but i think there's some there's something that's happened in our society and where we are and i think the urgency around the climate crisis that people are listening to the youth now and i think storytelling has a lot to do with that and i, I would love to hear what Chantel thinks about that as well like people listen to these kids you know this short films that we did we we because they were based on the the young people standing declarations of um, basically explaining what their harm was, they were presented as um, evidence in quotation marks um, for their cases and the judges had to watch these short films and it was I think probably one of the first times of using storytelling and film like in the courtroom and you know we were able to hand uh, hand deliver a DVD to President Obama at the time. And we judges like watch their stories. They listen to them. We had, you know, some of the kids were on conservative talk show radio, you know, talking about their story. And 
there's something different about young people even going to city commission meetings and speaking to their representatives like the you know mayors and the city commissioners they stop and they listen and a lot of people are still dismissing them and and minimizing their involvement or or their knowledge or their concerns but i think for the i think the vast majority of people are now accepting that young people need a seat at the table um, not only to have their voices heard but to be part of the solutions they have ideas and this is their world to inherit and you know when it comes to climate change they are they are the ones that are going to be most disproportionately impacted, impacted by indeed. the decisions that we have made <laughs> And it lifts it out of partisanship because everybody has kids, no right. matter what side of the aisle you want. So yeah, weigh in, please, Chantal. And then I want to dive into No More Harvey's and the young woman, the one actress that you worked with who carried this incredible play that you wrote. So, so yeah, yeah dive I was, in about young I was, people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think, I think it's easier to believe that young people don't have uh, a very selfish agenda, right? Which is harder to believe when you have adults trying to push something. So I, that's my guess at, as to why people are listening to youth and um, we're not listening to scientists and to everybody else who has tried to sound the alarm before. Um, there's a, there's a, a genuine there's, there's just something. And also, um, just like you said, Christy, it's their world. It's their world to inherit. And so they're going to they're going to feel most of the impact. And, and we were part of uh, the harm of, you know, we like mm -hmm. consciously or not, we were we participated in causing the harm. And, and social media, I think, is also a, a key instrumental. And of course, that that weaves into you know, technology weaves into your play. So tell us, Chantal, tell us about No More Harvey's and the themes that you wove in and what was the spark for this particular play? Yeah, so No More Harvey is the third play of a series of eight plays about the Arctic. Um, and it's clearly about the US. And um, the idea came in 2017 when uh, Hurricane Harvey hit uh, Louisiana and Texas. And then just a few months later, I think it was three or four months later, um, the whole thing about Harvey Weinstein and Hollywood um, came down. And to me, <laughs> that was really big. I was like, Harvey and Harvey, it's the same systems that are creating both, <laughs> you know, like, isn't everybody seeing that? And so, and it was such a perfect um, theatrical device also nice. to use the name Harvey. And so um, that's that's the uh, inspiration for the play it was trying to connect. And also there was a lot of talk in the climate movement about connecting social justice with um, environmental uh, justice and uh, being able to talk about these things as connected as opposed to, you know, I'm, t I'm talking about race over here and I'm talking about economic equality over here and I'm talking about the environment over here so the play is a one person played as only one actress on stage and there's a but she talks to she has an alexa with her the, the amazon virtual assistant it's fabulous. <laughs> and so it's the story of her journey from new york to uh, anchorage in alaska and of trying to make sense of all of the harveys in this world the first one being her um, own husband harvey who uh, became physically abusive. And so she's running away from that. And then she's trying to deal with all of the Harveys, like Harvey the Hurricane, Harvey the Hollywood producer. Um, and she, she talks about two women that she wants to, two friends she has in, in Alaska that she wants to reconnect with, who also have been dealing with their own Harveys. So it's a story of her. Um, oh, and and I'm sorry, I forgot the most important character, which is a whale. <laughs> so she looks up to a whale and the evolutionary path of the whales who have come from 50 million years ago when they were mammals and they lived on land and they had legs and teeth and then they migrated to the ocean. So it's also a story of, about migrating because um, the whale migrated and has survived everything that has happened in the last 50 million years and and so she tries to 
figure out what is the difference between migrating and fleeing and migrating is when you had a destination you have something to go forward to and fleeing is just running away from danger so i don't think i'm doing a great job at because i <laughs> the, i mean i'm explaining it you the way the play is job which is kind of all over <laughs> so maybe we shouldn't call it climate migration it should be climate climate fleeing <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, right. Dwayne, I love that you touched on the whole migration versus fleeing. I mean, it really drives home the issue of, you know, what everyone, so many people around the world, even in the United States, you know, we think it's not going to happen here. But of course, it's it's absolutely going to happen here. Uh, Florida, California, the need for migration, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and the whale was, you know, again, it was this understanding of the diversity, both of you, the understanding, the weaving together all of the issues and understanding the, the diversity. And in your case, Chantal, you weave in other beings, other sentient beings, and uh, in, as you have done in some of your other plays as well. Mm -hmm. um, so... Chantal, sticking with your, your um, the, the run of the show's over. So what's um, the, the play is going to be pre uh, published and it will be available to do uh, along with your other plays. And what are your two other plays that are published? So the first one is uh, called Sila. It's set in Canada. Second one is, the title is Forward. That one is set in Norway. And um, No More Harveys will be published. It will come out towards the end of 2022, at the end of the year. Excellent. And before I ask you about the next play, what, 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 what will be number four? Um, I want, I love Sila, what the, the word Sila. Please share with our listeners what that is. Yeah, Sila is an Inuktitut word, which is the language of the Inuit in Northern Canada and the Canadian Arctic. And it means uh, a combination of breath, wind, uh, climate. It's the place where we come from and the place where we return. Mm, so beautiful. It's a beautiful so, concept. I can only imagine what it was like to delve into that. Um, what was it like uh, working with the, the people of the Arctic? It was... Um, it was, it was a huge, I mean, Christy, when you said you had to learn about um, the legal system, I mean, this was the same for me. I had the first play, I had to learn a lot about climate science, but also discover this whole world, the Arctic that I knew nothing about. I had never been there. Um, and it's so um, foreign in a way. It's so complete, at, at least in Canada, I think Norway is a bit more similar to the rest of the country because they have more infrastructure, but the Canadian Arctic is very isolated. And so it's a whole new world to discover and a whole new culture to discover. Mm. And I, and your, your, your care for the people comes through in your writing. Mm, thank you. It's really quite beautiful. So, um, we have just enough time. We've got one minute. What What's the idea for the fourth play? You can't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do but have an say, idea for it. I you, do, but I'm not going to say it. Excellent. But I will say. Which will country say does it take place um, in? I'm, yeah, it's Iceland. <laughs> ah, I love it. I love, love, love it. Okay, well, on that note, we will take a break. And when we come back, what's next? I want to hear about, you know, how the two of you with these incredible careers just refocused your lenses and got right into the climate change issue. When we come back with Chantal Bilodeau and Christy Cooper on the Edge of Every Day. Stay tuned. I am Joseph Franklin McElroy, host of the new podcast, Gateway to the Smokies. It airs on talkradio.nyc every Tuesday night from 6 p.m. to 7. Every episode is dedicated to memorable experiences in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and surrounding areas. This show features experts and locals who will expound upon the richness of culture, history, and adventure that awaits you in the Smokies. Tune in every Tuesday from 6 p.m. to 7 on talkradio.nyc. 
Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauber, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Chipping around, kick my brain to the ground. These are the days it never rains. And we are back with Christy and Chantal. Thank you, Christy. Um, yeah, uh, it depends on the theaters. We're having little chats in our commercial breaks. And um, um, the question being, how does Chantal get um, her work out, seen out in the world? Because it's theatrical, um, there's some um, there live streaming issues and, and uh, union issues issues it depends on the theater I, th I think is yeah like with distribution um so it's not quite as cut and dry with and getting people all of the actors to be in agreement etc cetera, etc cetera. did you get a you got a um a, a recording of it though Chantal for your archival purposes yes I, I will yes good yeah. good 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 okay so I want to dive in what was Chantal we'll start with you and then we'll move to Christy what was the, how did you make this lens shift into, um, you know what, I want my work to be about climate change rather than just overall playwriting, which is a beautiful thing, but. Um, I, I think it's a little bit like Christy again. It was like being at the right place at the right time. Um, mm -hmm. I took a trip to uh, Alaska because I had a friend there and he had always said, you should come and visit and I had never gone. And it was just life changing. Um, yeah, yeah, it was. It was so incredibly beautiful. It's so. Um, it's uh, it's like a postcard everywhere you look. Um, people live very close to their land. You know, it's they 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 don't have the same. In New York City, we're surrounded by concrete, um, so it's a very different relationship and. Uh, it was at a time where climate change was being talked about a bit more in the mainstream media. And so I, of course, I thought I was going to do one play and then I got so immersed into that world that now I've committed to do eight, hopefully before I die. <laughs> You'll totally do it. So, but Al Gore's movie had come out. That was a- Yes, a, the um, year before, yes. Yeah, and, and that really was a game changer, at least for me, it was a game changer yeah. to get things on, on my radar. Um, well, and, and Christy, you, you shared part of this story, um, but you know, how, how does somebody who's doing research in, in, in Sweden, <laughs> yeah. um, like go, you know what, I want to be a climate change filmmaker. Well, I didn't set out to be a climate change filmmaker and I don't know if I necessarily call myself that I've done, uh, I no, have done course, quite a few yes. climate change films, but I've also done other work. Um, but yeah, I, I, so my focus in, when I was a scientist um, was in the field of stem cells. Oh, and, yes, yes. and I was working, I worked in Germany and in Sweden um, for 18, 19 years. And when I was in Germany, it was the Bush Kerry election. And there was, it, this was a moment in, you know, U.S. history where all of a sudden there was a scientific topic that was driving policy or driving political discussion and discourse. And um, it was all about stem cells. And 
I remember being so dismayed by the rhetoric and the, you know, really false information and misinformation that that was being spewed here in the US. And as a scientist working in the stem cell field, I felt really drawn to what does that look like to be a communicator about the work that I do. Mm. And um, we had already kind of started um, doing much more of that layperson and community outreach around the work that we were doing. I'll, I'll skip kind of forward. I, I joined an EU consortium um, of travel uh, to create traveling science fairs, um, and it was interdisciplinary. We were working with, you know, historians and psychologists and, you know, all kinds of really cool disciplines to talk with people in the community about science. And then I decided I wanted to leave academia and figure out a way to integrate the, the communication and the story, storytelling aspect into the, the scientific background that I had. So that's what brought me back to the US to get my MFA in science and natural history filmmaking. In my first year in grad school um, in the spring of 2010 was when the BP um, Deepwater Horizon disaster happened. And I packed up my car, I live in Montana I packed up my car with a friend of mine, Devin. We put all of our film gear in and we drove down to Louisiana with the intention to help the scientists get the word out about what was happening. And this was before the oil had come into the Gulf or come into the Bay. Um, and so we, we headed straight towards Southwest Louisiana outside of, of um, New Orleans. We connected with scientists. They took us out into their boats um, and they were water sampling and air sampling and we were documenting all of this. and. We started talking with the guys who were actually kept captaining the boat and they were um, two brothers and they started telling us about their story. They um, are, were from, they are Native Americans, live outside of the levee system. They're from the Atakapa Ishak tribe and they were captaining these boats because they had been pulled out of the bay as shrimpers and oystermen because the bays had been closed to shrimping. They, had, they were going, getting ready to have their last day um, of shrimping. And they invited us to go with them on their last night of shrimping. And so we we went with them and shrimped their last night. And then they invited us to stay with their uh, stay with them. And we lived with them for three weeks in their home and watched as the oil came in. And you know, they took us all around and showed us the devastation of what the oil industry has done to this part of the world. You know, tens of thousands of miles of oil pipelines that go run through these marshlands. And to just witness the devastation of saltwater intrusion and land erosion and, you know, truly a marginalized community and in the face of all of these disasters. And, you know, they had barely just survived Hurricane Katrina and now we're facing this oil disaster. So that was for me really this pivotal moment of realization that like I, Yes, science is a part of this. Science will always probably be a part and the heart of what I do and maybe perhaps is, is part of how I tell a story, but um, at the heart of it, like I'm so drawn to, to the human, to the human. I'm, I'm drawn to the human story and the human aspect and how we as humans are woven into these stories. And that is really the heart of it. It's, I, I think I, I'm more drawn to justice than anything, all mm -hmm. forms of justice. And that was that was what I realized, and that has since been been my focus. Oh, beautiful! And Chantel, yeah, I'm sure that that what you, applies to you as well, and your your love of science, and your working with scientists, and being drawn to the social justice. Can you comment on that? Yeah, it was I. I you know, I went the other way around. Not, not that I know that much about science, but it was interesting uh, coming from the arts to connect with scientists and to I, there's many scientists I've met who I would ask, what is the one thing you wish people knew about what you do that people don't know? Um, and I always get fascinating answers. Um, and, th and then I, I, and then it's my job then to sit, how can I communicate that? How can I help get that out there? Um, and it's, uh, I feel like it deepens stories, science, but also um, e everything that's going on uh, socially, it deepens stories because for a while there we were very focused on family in the theater there was a lot of um you know throughout the 50s and 60s I think a lot was about the family and dysfunctional families and relationships and i think it's nice to expand that and take the whole world in absolutely well and 
with science being under such uh, such fire right now, I mean the importance of of bringing science to light like this in a way that that is captured through storytelling and is woven in with the emotional stories and the environmental stories. They, there's no you can't negate it. Um, and science is its own, to me, science is, it's poetry, you know, it's its own poetry. Oh, I love that. So, you, yeah, you just capture it in another art form and um, it doesn't have to be uh, shared as hard data. It can be shared as the, the whole phys- philosophy behind it and, and the poetry that it brings up. That's spectacular. Christy, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we've seen with the pandemic um, the importance of science as part of our daily life, and I think I think the last two decades, I think you know our our country in particular, the U.S. I've witnessed life in other, at least in European countries, and and how science is approached, and you know we we have really lost our our general public quest for understanding science and it being part of our daily conversation and and you know I, I I think I think like you said Chantel it being it being poetry it being its own story you know I think we I think we as storytellers like to to weave that's you know that's science because I mean look what happened the last two years science was such a part of our daily life and such a part of this whole pandemic story that we are going to be telling for decades to come um that I, I think we can we can no longer like disconnect the science and the facts and and how that impacts our lives and how we need to understand it in order to find solutions and to move forward. And we need to find ways um, to accurately and effectively communicate that too. Mm. And I would go take it one step further that, that, that science is so poetic. And for me personally, with the art and the spiritual connection and the understanding, the, the sacredness and the that science the connection of science and quantum understanding with our spiritual understandings with getting back to the notion that our earth is sacred and bringing that philosophical and spiritual understanding into this poetic creative scientific understanding as well that it really is all connected interconnected Mm -hmm. Ah, well, we uh, only have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to take us into break a little sooner so we can uh, just pick that time up in our last section. When we come back with Christy Cooper and Chantal Bilodeau, we're going to hear about what's next uh, for each of them, find out where we can learn uh, more about their um, online presence, etc., etc., and get some final words of wisdom from each of them when we come back on The Edge of Every Day. Hey everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. In a post-COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be Frank About Health to advocate for all of us. Calling all pet lovers. Pet Avengers, assemble! On the Professionals and Animal Lovers show, we believe the bond between animal lovers is incredibly strong. It mirrors that bond between pets and their owners. Through this program, we come together to learn, educate, and advocate. Join us live every Wednesday at 2 p.m. at talkradio.nyc. 
listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Chipping around, keep my brain to the ground. These are the days it never rains. On the edge of every day. And we are back with Chantal and Christy. So Chantal, your next project, Earth Intention, a climate cabaret. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that is? And I can help. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> it's a collaboration. It is. Um, so climate... Uh, so often when we talk about the climate, it's uh, it's very negative stories that we hear. It's stories about um, disasters. It's stories about policy failure. And so I wanted to do something that, with music, you know, have a cabaret, have performers tell us how they connect to the earth and uh, find songs to sing that would make us uh, reflect and feel the earth without having like a whole lot of conversation for change. So um, it's taking place in the Catskills uh, and it will be live streamed. So it's available everywhere on May 21st and 22nd. And yes. it's called wow. Earth Intention, a Climate Cabaret. Fantastic. I love that title. Very proud of that title. Yes, it's happening in a salon space, a private salon space in the Catskills, and it will be live streamed. And there are seven uh, performers. Uh, myself, I, I introduced the show um, and the intention of the show. We have woven in a variety of singers from different backgrounds, some singer, songwriter, musicians, Woodstock based, um, some New York City cabaret people. Um, we have indigenous, we have speakers. Um, interestingly enough, to our point about youth, two of our speakers are uh, 25 and under, which I think is so spectacular. And on social justice and environmental justice, it just rocks. Um, and it will be, yes, uh, May 21st at 4 p.m. Eastern Time and Sunday, May 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can get tickets for the live stream at Chantal's website, artsandclimate.com backslash earth intention. And all of that information... Org. I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, it's dot, .org. Dot .org. .org. Yes. I knew that. Yeah. I was just testing you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. And all of that will be in the show notes as well. Um, so uh, really looking forward to that. So now, Christy, what's what's what do you what message do you want people to take away from the movie that you mentioned two really wonderful things and something that I read? Um, and and what, what's going on with the case now? Um, yeah, maybe I'll start first with what's going on with the case. Um, so right. the film the film ends on a note with the Ninth Circuit Court decision and kind of kind of leaves a cliffhanger. Um, and and part of that is because we want people to get involved and 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 want to know where the case is going. Um, so the the plaintiffs filed a motion to amend their complaint last March, um, which is is very common in lawsuits, and they are wanted to amend their complaint more in line with the Ninth Circuit Court decision. So um, that they had that hearing last June. Um, we are now waiting still since last June for Judge Aiken's decision in the district court um, as to whether or not she will allow them to amend that complaint. And and basically the what they're asking for the courts to, to do is to allow them to focus their complaint more on the declaratory relief aspect of their of their case, which is very similar to Brown versus Board of Education and and oh. how how desegregate desegregation happened. It's first it's first declaring that there is a constitutional right and that this right is being violated. Um, so we'll wait to see what happens with Judge Aiken and what her decision is. We are hopeful that she's going to rule in their favor at which point we'll see how the Biden administration responds. Um, so far, the DOJ under the Biden administration has taken a, the same stance that the Trump administration has taken. 
um, which is basically preventing these kids from having their day in court. You know, you see very, you see several um, hearings throughout the film, and not one of these hearings was a was the actual evidence being presented. It's they've all been procedural hearings. So they still have not gone to trial. They have not presented their evidence. And that is really, you know, what they're asking for the courts to allow them to do. And they're also asking for the DOJ to allow them to do that. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Um, uh, um, in terms of the messaging from the film, you know, I think I think there's a lot of them. We've been talking about the power of the youth voice and, um, you know, and that's a huge component of this film. The reason that they are youth in this case is because they, you know, most of these kids could not vote um, when they sued the government. They, you know, as children, as minors, they are not, they do not have a political say in our system. So the only recourse that they have is through the judicial system. And the judicial branch is there to protect us from harm by the other two branches of government. That's one of their roles. So I think, you know, we, we really want people to understand the importance of the judicial system in helping to solve the climate crisis. And we also really want people to understand how we got here and that this is not, you know, people talk all the time about climate inaction and that our government has not acted on climate. You cannot have a constitutional claim based on inaction. So this case is about willful action, affirmative action yes. that the government has taken in creating the climate crisis and supporting and promoting and um, you know, financing, subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. They have locked us into a fossil fuel-based energy system, which is now you know, dangerously harming these children's future. So we would love for, you know, I, there's so much to learn in this film. You know, you really can learn about the judicial system and about our government and the history of, of how we got here. And, you know, we just we just really want people to to become engaged and realize this is not a partisan issue. All of our administrations, the past sixty years, have done this, and this is not about Democrats. It's not a political Republican. issue. It's not a political Hello. issue. This is not. This is about our rights, all of our rights as citizens of the United States, and what the responsibility of our government is in protecting us. Yeah. And so um, what advice do you give to people? I mean, again, this the the for, for someone like me, I, I can say he, here's a resource. Go go take climate reality leadership training and you'll mm -hmm. learn, you know, for, for those people who want to be more educated. That's a resource. Those of us who want to do more than I mean, recycling is a beautiful thing. Um, getting d d the steps that we all have all learned is getting out of uh, out of doing whatever we can small steps staying engaged is a beautiful thing but mm -hmm. we have to up the ante and to your point it's getting involved with the government how what steps do you and and supporting the people that want to get involved with the government like these young people what steps how mm -hmm. do you what do you suggest for people to do steps to take that can really continue to move this up and forward well i think because this case is still an ongoing case in the courts it's still live these plaintiffs need a lot of support. You know that they, they there's there's many moments. Um, there and there's people many... that weren't in the movie that are still in cases as well. There right? are so so our children's trust is is also representing state cases. There's seven current um, state cases pending in the United States right now. Um, folks can go to ourchildrenstrust.org and learn more about those cases. There's also international cases around the world where youth are suing their governments based on their constitutions. Um, so, you know, I think I think supporting youth in this work that they're doing, there's so many ways that that we as adults and people with power can support them, you know, whether that's driving them to city commission meetings so that they can testify, um, training them on how to testify, training them on how to speak to their leaders, um, providing spaces for them to come together where they can have safe spaces to organize and to 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 take their actions. Um, our Children's Trust, you know, if people go to Our Children's Trust and follow them, there will be periodically asks for how folks can support these cases and the young people. Um, and, and really our North Star goal um, was really to help and to encourage folks to hold their governments accountable um, when it comes to the climate crisis from their local representatives, you know, all the way up to our federal government. And there's Amen. so many ways that that can happen. Amen. Great resources. So people can find Youth v. Gov 
Oh, uh, d obviously, we've mentioned it's streaming. Congratulations, uh, <laughs> getting it onto Netflix. Yes. Thank you. Um, d and your website? And we have educational distribution, and folks can, can find that on our website. It's youthbgovfilm.com. So if you're interested in doing community screenings or getting this film into schools or law schools, universities, um, we do have educational distribution through Good Docs. You can go through good, gooddocs.org or come to our website and we'll be happy to help you. Yeah, and I'd love to have that at, at my salon space, The Plum. And, and Chantal and I can do something in, in conjunction with a screening of that movie. That would be and fun. She, it would be totally fun. And Chantal has um, uh, your website, artsandclimate.org and that's where you can find out about uh, Earth Intention in May, 21st and 22nd of May. And then, and you also have an incubator coming up in Anchorage, correct? Yes, that's a five day um, think tank slash workshop for uh, artists, activists, scientists, educators, anyone who's interested in the intersection of arts and climate and wants to dig into that a bit deeper. I want to come. <laughs> I've never been. Hello. I've never yes. been. Yes. <laughs> I've never met you. Well, you and I have talked about this. Yes. So artsandclimate.org. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. All right. And those of you who are listening in, any last words of wisdom from our two ladies? Uh, Chantal, you first. Um, uh, find, you know, think about what you're passionate about and then mm -hmm. find how the climate is, uh, affecting that and, and get involved. That's brilliant advice. Find what you're, and how climate is affecting what you're passionate about. Brilliant. Yes. Christy, any last words? Yeah, I would say opinion? stay engaged and, you know, talk about, talk about the issues that you care about and, find your tribe, find your community, find that support that you need in order to, the world's really hard right now. There's, there's a lot of things that are Very really overwhelming. hard and you need that support. We, we need to uplift each other and um, hold hands while we're doing it. And I just encourage everyone to find that, that support network that they need to do that work. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful ladies. Thank you so much for joining me on the edge of every day and sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and your creativity and your storytelling. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Chantal. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and for those of you who are listening in, thank you for spending this hour with us. Remember, you are always at the edge of the miraculous. See you next time. Under pressure Under pressure